right? There we go. Okay. All right, there we go. So we, all right, so now we're going to get on to chapter 10. And this test is 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. All right, now, last time we did this, we started talking about mitosis on Monday. What was the point of mitosis? The idea of mitosis is what? We take one cell and make how many? Two, Two right? So how many chromosomes per human cell? And a typical human cell? 46. Okay, if you do this division, how many chromosomes will be in the new cells that are made? 46 and 46, all right? So far, so good. Now, that was what we covered last time. Now, essentially, those will be the same cells that come out as the one cell that went in. Now, is that, is there, is that totally true? What can happen in the intro? You can lose some. You, know, you can actually lose a little bit on the ends of DNA, and you can also have a random mutation. Right? So you can have some little error crop into the system so that what comes out is not exactly the same that went in. But for the most part, we think that what came out is the same that what went into it. One cell with 46 chromosomes split into two separate cells, each with 46 chromosomes. When the DNA split in the middle, we called that what? Mitosis, right? Now, what were the stages before that? We had interphase. What are the stages of interphase? Not PMAT, that's mitosis. G1. S and G2, correct. G1, we duplicated the components in the cell. S, DNA synthesis. So we had some other stuff going on. All right. Now, this is good because what comes out is identical. Okay? And a lot of times, that's what we want. But sometimes we don't. And that's the point of today's lecture. Okay? How, thing is, we're all different. From my perspective, guess what I see a bunch of? I see a bunch of diversity. I see a lot of different shapes, faces, sizes, attributes. Okay? Everyone here is different. You go outside, you walk down campus, you're going to see probably, what, a lot of different people. Do you see a lot of the same looking people? No, everyone's going to look different. Okay? So we're going to talk about the mechanism that we get this difference. We're going to talk about the mechanism that makes you different than your sister, that makes you different than anyone else, that makes you completely unique. Okay. I like to describe it as the lottery of life. Does anyone here feel unlucky, down? Well, if you do, understand this. You may feel unlucky, but by you being here, by you existing, you have won the lottery of life. And we'll talk about why. Long story short, there's so much genetic combinations that the right sperm cell united with the right egg cell in just the right time, and you're here. If that had been delayed by minutes, arguably seconds, guess what? Someone else would be sitting in that chair right now. Totally different person. So you might feel unlucky, but you really have won the lottery of life. Statistically speaking, you're incredibly lucky. All right, and we'll talk about why that is in a few minutes. All right, so we talked about this idea of asexual reproduction. We talked about mitosis in this regard. Point is, and this again is mitosis. One cell passes its genes on to the next two cells that it uh, comes from. Okay. Now, there's advantages to this, there's disadvantages to this. And I don't want to imply one is better than the other. It says in certain situations one's good, in other situations the other one's good. It just depends on the situation. Alright? So let's talk about some advantages, some pluses and minuses to this asexual reproduction. First advantage is that it's pretty quick and efficient. It's really fast. When we start talking about meiosis, we have to, or uh, meiosis, and again, meiosis is really pronounced meiosis, but I overpronounce it for the purposes of this class. When we start talking about meiosis, you have to have specialized organs. 
you have to have us. Uh, it, it's it's a not as fast of process as, as mitosis. Another advantage of this is you need one cell per person. How many cells do all of us come from ultimately? Well, two fusing into one. So, you know, we just come from one cell and that develops af with mitosis afterwards. And the other thing is there's no variation. There's no variation. That's good because sometimes we don't want variation. Where was an area we had a lot of mitosis in? Our, our skin, right? Our skin cells is always constantly in this constant state of mitosis. You know, we don't want a lot of variation there. Okay, so there's a lot of times we don't want variation. Disadvantages is there is no variation. We need variation for there to act, be acted upon by nature. Good example here is one of those you know, very basic examples. Think about two different animals. Okay, one population we have no variation. So here's a little thing, here's a tree. And in one population we've got all the same size animal. Terrible drawer. Say that. We have no variation. And when these animals can get up on their hindquarters, they can get up and eat some of this uh, fruit from this tree, and they live. But what happens if the tree starts growing taller such that there's no more short trees? What happens to the population? It dies because there's no way for it to get to that tree because there's no variation. But let's say another population had taller species, or maybe one that had maybe more claws, some type of variation that could get to the fruit that's higher. That makes sense? I know it's a basic example, but the point is, if there's variation, when the environment changes, there's something that can address those changes. If there's no variation, there's nothing that can address those changes. That's, that's the quintessential idea of evolution. All right. Or it's a core idea of evolution, I should say. There's some type of change or variation present that can be acted upon by the environment. All right. Okay. It introduces us this idea of sexual reproduction and meiosis. Here we're going to be a combination of a, contrib a genetic contribution from our mothers and our fathers. So your mother and your father will contribute part of your genetic makeup in this, uh, in this situation. And there will be enough differences that you are different from both of your parents. You may look like some of your mother and some of your father. You may have different uh, attributes of both. But you'll never look exactly like your mother. You'll never look exactly like your father. You may be close, but you, genetically speaking, are unique. There's no one else like you, barring uh, a twin. You know when they said in, high, in elementary school that you're special? Well, you kind of are. There's nothing, no one else with the same genetic makeup as you are. You really are special. I'm not trying to say that like, you are special. <laughs> you got a win-win personality. No, genetically speaking, we are all unique. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. So what are some advantages to sexual reproduction? Well, one advantage is that we have variation from our parents. Okay, we're going to be a mix. We have strengths and weaknesses from our mother and from our father. And when changes happen in the environment, that strength and weakness may be beneficial to us. Honestly, it also might be non-beneficial, might be harmful to us. But the point is we have variation. There is some variation there. Important for populations because there's some type of variation in the population. So when an, an, when an environment changes, 
some of the population can address that change. Right? Let's just say, let's just use weight, right? Maybe the predisposition to get gaining weight, right? Some parts of the population are very thin, some are very heavy. Something happens in the environment, it becomes colder, that heavy population may have an advantage over the not so heavy uh, population. Okay. Some, type of popu some type of variation that can be acted upon. All right. But there are some disadvantages to sexual reproduction. Okay. First of all, males and females have to find each other. Easier said than done. Now, you can find each other, but when you talk about finding each other and finding a mate, that's energetically expensive. Okay, which one sounds like a better line? Um, hey, I'll, I'll pick up my Camaro at 8. Or, hey, I'll meet you and we'll take the Gamecock Express somewhere at 8. <laughs> which one sounds better? Which one's a, a better line? Yeah, I'll pick up my Camaro at 8. Yeah, okay. Point is, it's energetically expensive to find someone to um, share genetic material with and to have offspring. It, it, it really is. It, it, not just, you know, using a human example, but um, birds, for example. Plumage on birds. It's energetically expensive. All right. Yeah, if you, if you do the Gamecock Express, then you can say, Hey, Mom, you can follow me on the app. You know where I'm at. All right, <laughs> but you get the idea. Sexual reproduction on, on, a, on an energetic level is expensive. All right, energy intense. All right, so the idea of genes and alleles. And the best analogy I have is maybe not the perfect analogy, okay, is the idea of going and getting a car. You ever go get a car and the dealer comes in and he says, well, here's the option list. You ever see that? Right? So he'll say, here's the option list. Here's the seats. Here's the uh, radio. Here's the exterior trim. All right? We have some options for seats. We have some black seats, some brown seats, maybe some red seats. I don't know if that's your thing. Sure. All right, the radio. You may have the basic radio. You may have the one with Bluetooth. You may have the one with Bluetooth and navigation. Okay? Exterior trim. You may have no chrome. You may have lots of chrome. You may have the, you know, you, know, you see people that like get like these little fake airlets on the sides of their car. Like they, they like it's, you know, like an, uh, I don't know, a 98 Caprice and they, and they have a little stick on things on the sides, like they need venting on that uh, 98 horsepower engine. Uh, you know, fake airlines. I don't know. I don't care if you're going to get that on your car, sure. All right, so the idea is you, you have different options, right? For seats, you might want the black seats. For the radio, you might want the Bluetooth radio. You know, you're good with your phone for navigation. For the exterior trim, you're not going to get those fake airlets. You're just going to go for you know, a little bit of chrome, a little bit of bling. Idea I'm trying to get here is the idea of genes versus alleles. Okay, we all have different combinations of alleles. Okay, we basically genes are going to be regions on the DNA that code for a specific thing, but the version of that gene is the allele. Okay, so the idea here is the seats. From this analogy, it's not a great analogy, but I think it will work. The seats are like a gene. The radio is like a gene, and the exterior trim is like a gene. Alleles are the black seats, the brown seats, or the red seats. The red version, the black version, or the red uh, brown version. The radio, the alleles would be like the radio with no option, the radio with Bluetooth, the radio without Bluetooth, or radio with Bluetooth and navigation. So, for example, let me give you a more human example here. Let's talk about blood type. Chromosome, drawing one particular area. How many have we have how many chromosomes? Forty-six. How many from a mother and father? Twenty-three. All right. So this is chromosome from our father. 
the we call it homologous chromosome from our mother. And we're looking at the area for blood type. So our mother has given us a contribution, and our father has given us a contribution. Okay. So what I'm doing is this area right here is this stretch of DNA, the sequence of this DNA. This stretch right here is this sequence of DNA. Okay. One's from our mother, one's from our father. All right. Now, this idea of options. Is anyone in here type O blood? You are? All right, we're part of the same group. All of us guys, ladies, we have an O allele here and an O allele here. Those are our two options. So we have an O allele and an O allele. Consequently, we have type A blood. Okay, our options, we, we've picked on that example, we've picked those two options on that set. Does anyone here have type AB blood? You got type AB blood, you, you too too, okay. Well, you guys are a little bit different. Same genes for blood type, but you have an A allele on one and a B allele on the other. Now, it may be from your father and mother and mother and father. We can't determine that from what you've told me, but we ha there are different options there. Just like the idea of having here the idea of seats, right? We have brown seats, black seats, or red seats. Some of us have two O-type allele blood seats. Others of us have an, a, a red, an A allele and a B allele. We get type AB blood. Okay, so that's the that's the basic point about an allele versus a gene. An allele is the form of the gene. Does that make sense? All right. Okay. So again, alleles are different forms of the same gene. Okay. And it's those interactions between those two alleles that determine something. So the people that raise their hands, if you had type O blood, we have two O alleles. We're missing a particular compound on our red blood cells. The people that said, hey, we, I have type AB blood, you have two different compounds on your red blood cells that I don't have and some people up here don't have. Point is, we have one version of an allele, you guys have another version of an allele. We have the same stretch, we have the same gene on our DNA, right? I have a thing for blood type, people with type AB blood. You also have a thing for blood type, a gene for blood type. But the version of the genes that I have, and some other people in here have that have type O, are completely different than what your allele combination is if you have type AB blood. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, now some characteristics come from one gene, blood type being an example, but other characteristics are a function of multiple genes. And we'll talk more about that for the third test. We'll talk more about the idea of inheritance later on. So we'll get back to that idea later on. I don't want to live with the idea that one gene codes, is coded for by one allele. Or, excuse me, one characteristic is coded for by one allele. Sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. All right, so let's talk about this idea of meiosis. And I'm going to call it meiosis to overemphasize the E, but again, if you leave here, it's meiosis. Okay, but I like to overemphasize the E because I did get confused with that back in the day. Mitosis, meiosis sound a lot alike, don't they? To me, they do. Okay, so I'm going to overemphasize meiosis. But if someone sees this on YouTube and says, oh, he's wrong. No, no, I'm just, I'm just doing it to help you guys out. All right, so meiosis is the process that we are making sperm cells or egg cells. Specifically, the nuclear division to do that. Remember we talked about mitosis last time? And that was what we did to separate the DNA, so we had two perfect copies. Meiosis is going to be a little bit different. We're going to separate the DNA, but the idea is we're getting two or multiple different genetic copies. Two, and we're going to go for each of these points. Two, this makes cells with one half the number of physical chromosomes. Now we'll get the idea of haploid and diploid for the third test. But if we have 46 chromosomes in our cells, how many cells will a cell coming out of meiosis have? How many? Someone said it. 23. So your typical egg cell will have 23 
physical chromosomes. Your typical sperm cell will have 23 chromosomes. I put an asterisk next to that because there's situations where that's not true, and we'll talk about that idea later on. And then finally, when that sperm cell and that egg cell unite, we're going to have how many chromosomes? If a sperm cell has 23, and the egg cell over here has 23, and these combine, how many cells are we going to have at the end? 46. Okay. All right. We return to that. We 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 will return to that idea of diploid versus haploid here uh, for the next test. Now, where does meiosis happen? Specialized cells, specialized structures. You'll see this when you when you get into your you know, your next sequence of biology. You start talking more about plants. You also see it when you start talking about human reproduction. Point is, there are specialized structures in the body where meiosis happens. It doesn't happen anywhere else. Okay, it's not happening on my skin, right? You're covered in mitosis. Oh no, get it off. No, no, we're covered. We're not. We we are only doing this in specialized structures, and that's it. We don't want variation in our skin cells. We don't want variation in those type of things. We need variation for very limited reasons, and that's reproduction. Okay. Now here's the, I guess, the big picture of meiosis, and we're going to cover this a lot. Right now, that looks like a bunch of peach and yellow with a lot of basketballs. Okay, we're going to try to tease that out into some type of conceptual idea here in the next few minutes. Textbook definition of meiosis, it's a nuclear division. Nuclear division meaning the nucleus of the cell and sexually reproducing eukaryotic species. So here the idea is we're making eggs or sperm depending on the gender. Right. Now I know this is the textbook definition and we're going to hopefully get a a more conceptual idea of what it is going forward. Okay? Because right now that's just that's boilerplate. All right. So in sexual reproduction, we're going to make gametes. So a sperm cell or an egg cell is correctly referred to as a gamete. Combine them, we'll get zygotes, we'll, you'll talk about that in your next semester of biology. But for right now, you make a sperm cell, an egg cell, that sperm cell is a gamete, that egg cell is a gamete. How many chromosomes does a gamete have relative to the entirety of the organism? In humans, at least. We just said it. One half. One half. If a gamete is an egg or a sperm cell, and a normal cell has 46 chromosomes, I pull your skin cell off, I stain it, I look at all the chromosomes, I look at your cell, and I see there are 46 little dots in the nucleus. If I see that, okay, I then were to look at your gamete, how many, how many dots would I see in that context? 23. So here, I saw 46, right? Well, if this was a gamete, I would see 23. So instead of 46, I would see there being 23 here. Okay. Gametes have one half as many chromosomes as the other cells. For example, I've asked a question. Um, we think of an organism. Um, okay, uh, you a, a Klingon has landed on Earth, and you've done a genetic analysis of a Klingon, and you find this Klingon has 50 chromosomes in his cell. Based on human biology, how many gametes, how many chromosomes would be in his gamete? Assume it follows the same evolutionary pattern as humans. How many? 25. It's like a great test question, actually. Wow. Okay. 
Now we'll get to this idea of haploid and diploid later on. That's for the third test. We're really going to get into that point later on. Another thing, and we're just this is an overview right now. We're going to drill into these processes going forward. Okay. Something very special happens in this process. It happens during prophase one. And we call it crossing over. And we're going to get into this later on, but right now, let's just say that the blue DNA is from your father and the red DNA is from your mother. What's going to happen is that DNA will coalesce. And if we were to look, let's just say those letters, what do you think we would call those letters? Here we have B, A, G, and on the red we have a lowercase b, a, g. What do you think would be a good name for those letters? We just said it. What would we call this particular version of a gene? An allele. So you, your mother's and your father's genetic contribution to you, some of them have the same alleles, but then there's some we're going to have different alleles. So what we're going to do is your mother's and father's DNA and your gametes, or the formation of gametes, will swap switch places. So before, this is the before picture, this is the after picture. Okay, what's happened? What is, how is before different than after? It's like a highlights puzzle when you're at the dentist's office. Okay, what's changed? Two of the tips have swapped, such that now one has, well they both have contributions from the mother and the father's genetic material in you. Right? This is your genetic material. One half is from your mother, one half is from your father. This is, this is you. In this process, we're going to swap our parents' genetic material such that what comes out will be a hybrid of our father's material and our mother's material. It'll be a mix. Okay. This is a randomized event. I put an asterisk next to that because there's a little bit of debate on that point, but right now we'll say it's a randomized event. And we call that event crossing over. Okay. Now, these gametes that we form at the end will combine in fertilization to make a zygote. It will make a one cell structure, combining of two structures. Okay. Sperm and egg combine we form a zygote. Okay, once we form a zygote, what process do you think we're going to do? Mitosis or meiosis? Not meiosis. We've already got the diversity now. Mitosis. We're going to undergo mitosis. Eventually, and it's different for males and females, eventually meiosis will also kick in. Okay, there are some time differences on these, but um, meiosis will kick in when it's appropriate. But for the building of the body, creating the body, adding to bone, converting the cartilage into bone, all of that stuff, development, making neurons, it's all about mitosis, not meiosis. Okay. And again, we go back, different advantages. One's not better than the other, just there's different advantages to each. All right. We have two cell divisions. We have meiosis one and we have meiosis two. Okay. Meiosis one, we have prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, telophase one, meiosis two, we have that but with twos after it. So it's basically like two mitosis stacked one on top of each other. So how many stages does meiosis have? Well, each, each major stages. Two. Two major stages. Meiosis one and meiosis two. Okay. And we're going to talk about each one of these points going forward. This is, again, this is an overview. Any questions at this point? I know it's a complex topic, and if you have questions, this is the time to ask. And again, I know it's difficult because one, I'm drawing a bunch of letters and lines on the board, and I'm asking your mind to trick your mind into 
seeing that as something that's really happening. And I know it's hard. So please, if you have any questions, this is the time to ask. Uh, do I need to go back to anything yet? Okay, okay. So let's talk about meiosis versus mitosis. How many stages in meiosis? My, not me, my, my, mitosis, excuse me. How many stages in mitosis? One, right? Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. We group all those up, one stage. How many in my, meiosis? Two. How many cells do we get at the end of one mitosis event? Two. How many at meiosis? Four. And we'll explain why that is. Now, this is meiosis here, so we start with one cell. One cell becomes two, and each of those two duplicate, so we have four. Okay, again, an overview. We'll get into the specifics here in a few minutes. All right. Genetic differences. Are all four of these cells down here genetically the same or genetically different? They're different. If this was a male, what would we call these cells at the end after they matured? Sperm cells, correct. Genetic differences, we just said. Mitosis, no genetic differences, barring some random mutation. Meiosis, we have four genetically unique cells. Male-female differences. With males... In, well, let me say it this way. In mitosis, males and females undergo mitosis the same way. Okay? If you were to look at how a, a female's skin cell replicates, it's indistinguishable from how a male's skin cell replicates. Same thing's happening. But if you talk about how a female forms her gametes versus how a human male forms his gametes, there are some very important differences. We'll talk about those, but right now... Males will make four viable, barring any mutate, um, accidents in the process, will make four viable cells. Four sperm cells after the end of meiosis one and meiosis two. Human females will make one viable ovum or egg, and then they will make three polar bodies. Okay, the polar bodies are not viable for fertilization as is. It's only one will really be viable for that process. And we'll talk about that at the end. The point right now is there are some genetic differences in this, how this process happens. All right. So your typical cell, you pull out a skin cell right now, you've got 46 chromosomes. You pull out a neuron, 46 chromosomes. You pull out some skin cell, 46 chromosomes. You pull out a cell from your stomach, 46 chromosomes. I pull out any cell in anyone in here, most likely it will have 46 chromosomes. Now there are situations where you can have 47 chromosomes and some situations where you can have 45 chromosomes. But assuming that you are the typical human being, you're going to have 46 chromosomes. Of those, we have 23 homologous pairs. That means that 23 of them, well, let me say it this way. For every one chromosome you have from your mother, you're going to have another from your father. Okay, so if we were to group every, those light chromosomes together, we would call those homologous chromosomes. Okay, let's just say right now, you got this one from your mother, right? Going back to blood type. This chromosome you got from your mother, and this chromosome you got from your father, right? And if we were looking at this area here and this area here, we'd have the same gene. We'd have the same uh, area here. We would call these two what type of chromosomes? These would be what we call homologous chromosomes. Now, if you have 46 chromosomes, and for every one chromosome, there's a homologous pair from your other parent, how many homologous chromosomes do you have? 23. All right. 
Now, meiosis will make a will go from diploid to haploid. So what meiosis is going to do is it's going to go from an egg, or excuse me, it'll go from a cell that has 46 chromosomes. End of the day, it will make a cell with 23 chromosomes. Those 23 chromosomes, there should not be any homologous pairs in it. So, for example, let's just say you have type AB blood. The egg or sperm cell you produce will either have the chromosome that has a B allele on it, or it will have a chromosome that has an A allele on it. 23 chromosomes but they are not homologous pairs. These are homologous pairs. When you go undergo meiosis and when you make that gamete at the end, you're going to have either one or the other. You will not have both. Under normal conditions. Now there is an example where you can actually misform a gamete. And again, that's for test three in which case you would actually have some with, with homologous pair. But that is the exception, not the rule. Okay? That's the origins of things like trisomy 21, which is you have three, gene, three uh, of the same 21st chromosome, which is Down syndrome. Barring some rare event like that, no. Okay. So meiosis will have the chromosome number. So if you have 46 chromosomes, your sperm or your egg cell will have 23 chromosomes. Okay? If something has 76 chromosomes, and assuming it follows the same rules, it would have how many in the uh, how many chromosomes would be in that uh, gamete? That's 76, right? That's the diploid number. What's half of 76? 38. All right. So now let's talk about the divisions here. There are two divisions in meiosis. That's why we say one is meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, because there's two separate rounds, or I called them stages beforehand. And meiosis DNA is replicated once, but it's divided twice. Okay, so let's give an example here. Let's say we got a we got a weird one here. We got some organism. Okay. And instead of having 46 chromosomes, this thing has two chromosomes. It's weird. It has a mother and a father. So how many chromosomes does it have from its mother? It has a total of two chromosomes. What? It's going to have one chromosome from its father. I'm going to use blue. Turn the light on here. It's going to use have blue from its father, and it's going to have a pink one from its mother. So the first thing here is we are going to duplicate the DNA. So what's going to happen when this duplicates? We'll have what? The blue and blue. And what? Pink and pink. Okay? So far, so good. So again, we still really have two chromosomes. Because if these are identical copies, if the top and bottom are identical copies, do we really have four chromosomes or just two? He yeah, says two, yeah. Okay? So we've got two chromosomes here. What we're going to do next, and this is prophase one, is these are going to combine, to coalesce. As they coalesce, 
combine, they're going to do that process we call what? Blanking over. Crossing over, where they're going to swap the same areas. Okay. So now we have a hybrid mix going on here where What we have in the cell is a mix of the mother's and father's genetic material crossing over. Okay? It's shown right here. Okay, so right here, if you can see the two pieces of DNA coming together, purple and blue, they're going to cross over. Do you see on this diagram right here, where before we had just purple and blue, but now we've got what? A mix, right? Okay, here we've got two, but I'm showing uh, one, well, here we have four, but here I'm showing two right here. Okay, so let me continue with the example here. All right, so now what's going to happen? What's the next step in cell division? So now we're in prophase. <coughs> Bless you. We did, we uh, have the condensed, we got rid of the nucleus. What's the next step after prophase? Metaphase, Metaphase correct. So now, let's draw it over here, cells here. Can you see that from the computer? Okay, so we have our cell here, and we're going to do what? Actually, let me, let me draw it up here, because I want to make sure you guys see this. So next, I'm just going to draw it up here. We have our cell. What happens in metaphase? What does the DNA do? It lines up, correct. So now, let's kind of be consistent here. One of these will be a lot of contribution from the mother, a little bit from the father. The other one will be a lot from the father, a little bit from the mother. And the other one will be blue, blue, blue. Pink, pink, pink. You guys see that? Okay, so this one right here represents this one right here. This one right here represents this one right here. Do you see this? All right. Now, what in the cell says that this will wind up on this side, and this will wind up on this side. Nothing. Nothing. This is the idea of independent assortment. Where these things go from here on out, nothing is saying that this top one will match with this one right here. See how we have a little bit from the father, a lot from the mother? And on this one we have a little bit from the father, a lot from the mother, a little bit from the father. See how these are on the same side? If we were to continue, what's after uh, metaphase? Anaphase. This separates such that what? We have blue and pink, and the blue, pink, blue in one cell, and the other one we have is it separates, we'll have the what? Pink, blue, and then pink, blue, and pink. And ultimately, these form two cells, right? But nothing in the world says that this will go with this. It could be that this flips, and this one right here goes with that one. Okay, this is the idea of independent assortment. Now, here we're showing just, you know, two chromosomes, right? How many chromosomes do we have? 46. Imagine a situation like this multiplied by many times. You see how this would create an incredible amount of diversity? That which side the chromosome goes to? There's nothing that says that this top one will match with this one. They are independent of each other. Independent assortment. All right? So then anyhow, we separate these two cells, and what have we made as a result? 
Two cells, that is correct. So I'll just draw it up here. And now we have two cells, right? One will have pink and blue. This one will have blue, pink. These two come from these two. These two are going to be in the other cell. You see? All right. That basically is meiosis one. That's meiosis one. Now, how many does this have? How many chromosomes does this have? Two. We got a homologous pair here. How many chromosomes does this have? Two. And this has two. What's the thing with meiosis? What are we ultimately forming? We're forming as many chromosomes or half the amount of chromosomes? I think you said it, what did you say? Half. So what are we going to do? This one is going to split, and this one's going to split. Are we going to, are we going to replicate DNA beforehand? No, we're not. All right. So I'm going to erase everything but these right here. This one is going to go this direction. This one's going to go this direction. Now we are in meiosis two. All right, meiosis two. All right, this one will get. This one goes with this one. This one goes with this one. This one goes to this one, and this one goes to this one. So we go pink, blue, pink. Now we've got one copy in each. This is what we refer to as haploid. If this is a male, a little bit more development, and we've now made our sperm cell. A sperm cell is a contribution of the mother's and the father's genetic material. Now, going back to the idea of independent assortment and how these things move around, nothing says one goes with one and one goes to the other. Which side of that metaphasic point these wind up on? Random event. Point is, here's the big kicking, here's the big kicker of the point. The genetic complement of all these sperm cells is so different. You won't have the same sperm cell ma being made. Two reasons. Crossing over, you know, sh split the DNA and shares it between different areas. And that idea of assortment, where nothing says that one goes with one and one goes with the other. It can go on either side of that metaphasic plate. Independent assortment. Massive amounts of diversity here. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay. okay. Now here's again another uh, picture. It's basically what I drew. On, on this we have meiosis 1, right? Prophase 1, crossing over happens. If you look at the colors here, uh, you can call it dark purple the male, the light blue the female, or whatever. We have two different um, genders being shown, they're complement. Anaphase 1, it splits, and then telophase 1, uh, we have two different cells with a slightly genetic complement. Okay. Meiosis 2, what's happening? We are, what are we doing? Here we had two separate pieces of DNA. Our gametes at the end have how many? One. Here we have one, two, three, four. Right? Can you see that? We have one, two, three, and four. How many do we have in our gametes at the end? Two. 
That's why our cells have 46 chromosomes. How many chromosomes will our gametes have? 23. All right. Now, what's going to happen when our gamete combines with another gamete? Each have 23 chromosomes. What happens? It, it completes back to 46. Correct. Okay, we'll get into that diploid and haploid idea later on. All right. So big advantages here is genetic variability. How we separated the DNA and the nuclear area, which is meiosis, gave us crossing over in prophase one. That swapping of the DNA. Random assortment. Which side of that metaphasic plate it went on? How it assorted? Randomized event. Another area of diversity. And finally, fertilization. This is not meiosis, but it's a consequence of it. Okay, You can combine your genetic material with many other people's genetic material that have done the same thing. So if the female did the same process in her and you did the same process if you're a male, you're both mixing and matching your DNA, right? And then you combine that mix and match DNA to make a unique organism, us. Genetically, we are all different, barring um, some random, you know, uh, twin. Okay. All right. Crossing over is that idea of how we swap parts in the DNA. I showed it up here. We'll show a few more pictures of it up here today. Okay. We're taking our mother's and our father's contribution. We have half our DNA from our mother, half of it from our father. We're taking that contribution, and where are we doing this? Are we doing it in all of our cells? No? Where are we doing this activity? All throughout our body? No, very specialized cells. Testes, for example. We have specialized areas we're doing this. We are making these gametes. Happens during prophase one. So here's that idea. Remember, we, and we've shown this picture before. We duplicate our DNA. Okay. This, is, this is a diagram of that duplicated DNA. The B's and A's are different alleles. The B came from, let's just say the dark purple came from your mother. It doesn't really matter if we, if we keep consistent here. Well, let's just say this is from your mother, and this is from your father. Right? There are different allele combinations at each one. Now, what's going to happen with crossing over? What are we going to do here? What are we going to do? These are going to combine and they're going to swap pairs. Okay, so let's go back to that last picture. Here we had, um, what, A, B, A, B, A, 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 B, B. Okay, so here we have A, A, that's right, A, A, and on the blue one we have Okay, try that again. Okay, I'll just describe it. We have A, big A, big B, big A, big B. On this one, on the blue one, we have little A's and little B's. What do you think this will be if, if it swaps pairs? Little A, little B, exactly. This was... A, this was A, behind it was B and B, A and A, B and B. So we're going to swap the pairs. So it will be what? A, B, 
B, and what else? A and little b. We've swapped pieces. Okay. Oh, well darn it. Here's a picture of that. Here's that same, I took forever to try to draw it out. But do you see what happened? We swapped pieces. That is crossing over. This is a result of crossing over. We've taken our mother's contributions to our genetic makeup. We've taken our father's contributions to our genetic makeup. We have swapped them around. And we've made a unique outcome. Okay. All right. I'll do one thing here. My computer's really run out of battery. Yeah, not good. Okay. There we go. Apparently the uh, PowerPoint up here is out, or the the plug I put my thing in here is out. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I didn't want the presentation to end early. That's not good. Okay. Questions? We good? All right. So a couple more things here, and we will be uh, done. Okay, you remember the idea of independent, the assortment idea? Okay, think of this as that, as that metaphasic situation, right? During metaphase, we have it all aligned. Do you see how we could have it aligned in different ways, such that one is on one side and then sometimes it can be on the other side? See how it can happen where we can flip the area it is? Randomized event. Again, this random assortment can make a multitude of products at the end. Introduces a lot of diversity. And that's kind of the point we're trying to get here. Both of these processes, crossing over and that assortment idea, can make a vastly different amount of gametes. Okay? So the gametes that you and I came from Okay, think of it this way. Let's just say, you know, your father and mother get together, they produce you, right? Might not want to think about it that way, but you have to. <laughs> All right? But what if something happened and there was a delay of five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, a minute? Guess what? You're not here. Someone else is you. Because why? A different gamete combined with the other gamete and a different organism is made. Let me say it this way. A different male gamete combined with the same female gamete. Because there will only be one egg in that, you know, if there's a delay of a few minutes. There will only be one egg, but you have many sperm, different sperm cells. So, um, point is, you have won the lottery of life. You're here. Congratulations. Excelsior to you. <laughs> All right. And then finally is fertilization. Now, fertilization is not part of meiosis like we've been describing it, but it's a consequence of it. Right? I'm combining some of your genetic material with someone else's, and the same process have been, has been going on in the opposing gender. Again, a whole switcheroo of their genetic material and your genetic material you combine it to make a unique organism. Okay, so I know they said this to you in school that you're special and you make you in, you encourage joy joy feelings and you're special. Genetically, you are very special. Congratulations, you are you are special. Okay, genetically speaking, you are very special. You are unique. All right, one last thing here, and we will be done. Oh, we're out of time, aren't we? Okay, um, you can read these in the notes, but I'll go through these real fast. Male sperm cells will make four genetically identical sperm cells. Okay, females will make 
four cells, but one will only be an ovum. One will only be viable. The other three will be non-viable. We call them polar bodies. Okay. The idea is that as the egg develops, it tries to give all of its cytoplasm to one egg. Okay. The deal of sperm is smaller the better, fast size. With the egg, one will get all of the good stuff, all the cytoplasm, at the expense of the others. So in a female, you start with one cell, and at the end of this, you form one viable ovum. With a male, you start with one cell, and you form four viable sperm cells. And you can see the reason why. Look at how big a sperm cell is versus an egg. One cell has gotten all the good stuff. Okay, so... Uh, that's the, the genetic, that's the difference between male and female. We'll, we'll get into that later for the next test. All right. I will also post a, get put a practice test on the genetics part uh, on Blackboard as well. So you see a sample test of that.